Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Once again, welcome to Open Source Software Development. As always, I hope you're doing well and staying safe out there during these difficult times. Today, I wanna to talk to you about uh, Git. This is the first of a couple of little talks I'd like to have with you about Git because Git is so at the heart these days of what we do as open source developers. So this first talk is a little bit about of background, a little bit of discussion of SCMSs and their role in open source development. And so let's just dive in and do this real quick. I don't want to drag it out the way I sometimes do when I talk about this because this is a su subject I find fascinating. It's near and dear to my heart, but let's at least get some basics down. So I just mentioned the phrase source code management system, which is a fancy fit phrase. You could also call it a version control system, a revision control system, a source code control system. All of these things are software tools built to do a job that historically was done in the software business by something called a change control board, which was a group of people whose job it was to manage changes to the software. And archival and library stuff was part of it. And plain old approval and verification of changes that were going in was part of it. And it's a job that still needs a lot of human input to be done right. But what we found starting a long time ago is that having tools really helps. And there's been sort of several generations of these tools. Git is pretty much for the last 10 or 15 years since its introduction been sort of a showcase tool for this particular set of tasks. But you may have heard of things like Subversion, Bizarre, Darks, Mercurial, RCS, CVS, there's been a billion trillion of these and they all sort of are attempts to do this same job. Well, what is this job? What is it that a source code management system tool is going to let you do? Well, it's nice to be able to go back and understand the past. That's true in any kind of engineering or science discipline it's especially true in software engineering where the past is full of clues to things and so things like version history what ver what did the source code look like what did the build artifacts look like what did things look like at some past known date or past known version number rollbacks uh, can we go back to the past and look to see what's going on Shared development is often well managed through a tool like this. When people introduce changes and other people also are introducing changes to the software sort of in the same time frame, then you need some way to resolve all that and understand what happened with all that. Diagnostic assistance, by which I mean debugging, it's really important in software debugging to understand not just what the software looks like now, but what its history is leading up to this. And in particular, it's really common to want to roll back the software to a version that didn't have a bug, or conversely, to verify that this bug has always been in the software. And both of those are really useful things to be able to do from the point of view of diagnosing, getting a root cause for a defect. Rationale capture. Why did we do that? It turns out that if there's a lot of clever things in software that you would like to uh, understand, because if you do, you can build on them, and if you don't, you can't. And so understanding why people did a thing is really important, and a good SCMS will help you with log messages, with revision history to understand why changes were made. And finally, you know, going clear back to Brooks and the Mythical Man Month, the development of software isn't very often 
I make a change, I make a change, I make a change, nice linear software development. Most of the time it's a web of different versions, different platforms, experimental stuff being merged. And when you're doing that kind of nonlinear development and trying to wrap everything together into a thing that's coherent is challenging. And that's one of the things that a system like this can get you. So for all those things in open source, most of us, most of the time these days, use Git. It's become the standard tool for that. And the structure of all of these things, but certainly of Git, is pretty much the same. There's this idea of a repository. A repository here is some, call it database-like thing, where I store information about the past, and a working directory, which is an attempt to be exactly what you would have if you didn't have a source code management system underneath you. So the idea here is that I do work in my working directory or I make my working directory look like some past version, whatever, and now I can interact with the project transparently, but changes I make are recorded, usually manually, in, you know, in the repository and if I want to get my working directory to the past or understand what happened with it or something like that the information in the repository is where I get all that and for most modern systems the structure of the repository is that it's some collection of what's called commits and what a commit is is a set of atomic simultaneous changes to the software that sort of constitutes a snapshot of the state of the software. So if you've ever played text adventures, it's pretty common that a text adventure will have a game save. You say save and all the state of the world will be written out to disk and later you can restore from that save point and get stuff back. And commits are essentially this for software. I save point the current state of the software including all the changes i've made since the last commit they all get rolled up and stored in the repository and those get managed by the tool and that's the standard structure there's sort of a historical split between the older and the more modern source code management systems older ones were centralized subversion was for the most recent sort of king of the source code management systems that was centralized and in subversion there the repository was kept in some machine that was usually remote from where you were working and there was the one repository the one database and if you wanted to do work you would ask the subversion system to create a working directory for you connected to that database. Any changes you made were committed centrally to that database. Any changes other people made, you would get from that central database. So there was really a repository, a central repository, and a whole bunch of working directories scattered around. That model has some issues. It has some issues with flexibility. It has some issues with usability. And so more modern systems tend to do what's called distributed version control. And in distributed version control, a particular project doesn't necessarily have just one repository. It may have many repositories. It may have repositories that capture, that are in different states at different times, capturing different working directories. And in Git and in most of these, each working directory is still associated with a, a single repository but that repository may be local and it may be synchronized with a central repository but they're two different repositories and so now we have multiple places to capture state which is great multiple places to capture history which is great we have this challenging problem of how do we keep all those things in some kind of synchronization so that what i see has some correspondence to what my coworker sees and that is the question that systems like Git answer satisfactorily. So like I've been saying, really, if you're doing open source in current year, you're probably using Git. 
there's a good chance you're using GitHub. I've mentioned before that I'm a huge fan of GitLab as well, which I think is a fantastic GitHub alternative. But the fact of the matter is that most of the community has latched onto GitHub as the thing these days. And so we'll be doing some GitHub most of the time when we're doing open source. GitHub is not Git. GitHub is a website designed to provide a central place for Git repositories to live, sure, but also some tools, some web-based tools to make those repositories easy to manage and interact with and to support software development in general. GitLab, same thing. And so when people say, I, you know, I'm managing my project with GitHub, well, kind of. You're managing your project with Git as source code management tool, and you may be using GitHub's tools to augment that process, and that's fantastic. Let's just acknowledge upfront that Git is hard to learn. The command line tools have a really awkward interface, partly because Git's internal structure is not intuitive at first, and partly because, just frankly, the inter interface is interestingly defined. There's rather a lot of GitHub command line, of Git command line tools, you know, I'm doing it, and they all have rather a lot of arguments, and the arguments are rather complicated and interacting complicated ways. There's just a lot of complexity. And part of that is that Git is trying desperately, on one hand, to be workflow agnostic. Whatever you can imagine is how you want to manage your stuff, Git probably has a way of supporting that reasonably cleanly, but that kind of Swiss Army knife level flexibility comes with a price. And the countervailing thing is that Git was originally designed by Linus Torvalds and his, a couple of his friends to manage development in the Linux kernel. There's a whole long story there that I think is pretty much in history at this point. But because of that, the practices that Linus used and that he wanted other people to use in Linux kernel development, those workflow practices take priority in the GitHub tools. They're the ones that are made the easiest. And the more that you develop in the way that Linus would encourage you to develop the easier GitHub, GitHub, the easier Git is to use. So, yeah, uh, the first thing is I'm not going to try to teach you in lecture the basics of using Git. I've linked here and in some on the website to some tutor on the course site to some tutorials and other resources. There's a ton of starting Git resources. And I would encourage you to get that basic familiarity with Git before, you know, sort of going on with this. You should be able to set up a basic site. You should be able to connect your site to GitHub or GitLab in some reasonable way. And you should be familiar with the ideas of pulling, pushing, committing. I'd like you to be familiar with the ideas of branches and checking things out, uh, merging branches should be a thing that's you have an idea of and all those things are covered by most basic tutorials and should be pretty straightforward to get a handle on I uh, mentioned resources here's some links this video is this Git tutorial man page is a man page. If you're comfortable reading man pages, it's great. This video is just one I picked after looking at two or three of them, and I honestly haven't even watched it all the way through, but skimming through it and looking at the comments on YouTube and stuff, it seems like it's a reasonable one. Uh, you may choose to Google for Git tutorial, and you'll have no problem finding resources there. The book Pro Git is online for free. Uh, I'm a contributing reviewer to the O'Reilly Git book, so I probably should be recommending that one, but this one is also quite good, if not better, and it is made freely available online, which is a big advantage. So if you're looking for a book-length Git thing, that's a good book I can recommend. So let's end with a quick summary of best practices of using this thing. I'm not gonna get into more technical details in this talk, but I do wanna sort of just talk about the very simplest stuff. Here's some things I recommend, and these are my recommendations, but I think the open source community wouldn't fight me too hard on most of them, of how you use this. The first thing is, it's really tempting to wait till later 
to get your stuff checked in to get get your stuff checked into your scms don't go ahead and jump in right away uh, as soon as you create a project as soon as you have an idea for a project go ahead and set up your git repository try to capture your commits from the first commit there's really no too soon to start thing and i can promise you that i have some huge regrets of things where i've lost ancient history in projects and i can promise you that i have no regrets of wow i really started this too soon secondly there's sort of two models that float around for open source. There's the one that's probably more popular, which is what I call idealized history, where you go ahead and make your commits, but then you go back and sort of rewrite history, and I'll talk a little bit about how to do this uh, subsequently, in such a way that you get, instead of the story of what actually happened, the story of sort of what you wish had happened. Uh, things get cleaned up, they get easier to understand. And rewriting history a little bit to do that is something that a lot of open source projects like. Their claim is that it makes it easier for uh, people trying to understand the history of the source code base if that history has been narrated a little, and it probably does. Their other claim is that it's likely to make automated debugging and that kind of thing easier if you've got a clean history and it probably does my argument is that i'm among other things a professor who of computer science who specializes in software engineering it's one of my areas i really hate to lose the real history and my other argument is that the more time you spend messing around with the source code management system a, the more you're going to avoid using it because you really don't want to deal with SCMS. You want to be writing code. And B, the more that you're going to make uh, a mess because mangling something always leads to messes. So these things are balanced off. I recommend the realistic history approach, but there's some various compromises you could work it's something you should think about as you set up your projects and you should understand when you're working in someone else's project what their policy is there here's the very short version of workflow i'm going to give a much longer talk later about the details of workflow first thing to remember always start your session with a pull whenever you sit down to do work on your project say git pull before you do anything else get your changes from upstream so that you are starting from as fresh a code base as you can as you work there again commit early and often that any time you have some coherent change done don't forget to stop and smash that commit button don't forget to run a commit so that you have your work captured again there's been a lot of times when i've regretted missing a commit that i wished i had there have been few if any times where i'm like wow that was too many commits and don't forget to push it's really really easy to forget normally at the end of your session you will have reached a stopping place where your changes should be visible to the your co-developers on the project into the world as a whole and your session should normally end with a git push it's really easy to forget that last push and it can lead to all kinds of confusion so if you do those things you'll be in pretty good shape as far as git basics and that's probably enough that's probably enough for one talk i will talk next about some fancier topics and some other things that are relevant I hate to spend so much time on Git, but it really is a central tool and maybe the central tool these days for managing open source projects. So I think it's worth it. Thanks as always for listening. Again, please stay safe out there during these troubled times. And I will talk to you again soon.